Well, good morning. It is a beautiful day. Happy spring. As of 1053 this morning, it is now spring. And I don't know about you, but I love spring. It's my favorite time of the year. Not that I don't like the others, but I really do enjoy spring. So, uh, happy spring to you. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Mark in the third chapter, as we look at the, the good news of Jesus Christ here in Mark chapter 3, 7 through 19, uh, that's the text we'll be looking at this morning. And once again, we're, God has granted us the opportunity to be able to come into His presence uh, and to come together before His Word. So let's, uh, let's read our text here this morning. Follow along if you would. And as I read, Jesus withdrew His disciples to the sea, and He a uh, great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumeum and, and from beyond the Jordan and from all around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and they cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have authority uh, to cast out demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name uh, Bonerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Mark gives us... A contrast here between the crowds that were following Jesus versus what Jesus is all about. And I think this text gives us a great opportunity to, to think through the kind of life that, that Jesus offers us and what it means for us to, to follow him. So this morning, I want us to, to break this down into a couple ways. And I want us first to look at the event here. And I want us to look at the crowd. Event number one is the crowd. And we see that in verses uh, 7 through 12. Mark here begins by saying that Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. Again, this is the Sea of Galilee where he's been spending quite a bit of time. This is where he's carrying out and doing his ministry. Jesus attracted growing crowds of people who were, who were struggling to do life. Uh, and he engaged with these who were broken. And he was offering them the good news of God's kingdom. And that's why they had come to him. Jesus' message is that the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus is the good news. And what he offers us in himself is life with God now and forever. And as Jesus is proclaiming his message, then uh, we, we've seen that he started to get some pushback from the Pharisees. The Pharisees saw Jesus as a threat to their carefully constructed religious system. The Pharisees kind of had a different understanding about God. They had a different understanding uh, about how God does things. And in their mind, Jesus didn't measure up. And the conflict then escalates, as we saw it with Jesus there uh, in a healing that took place in the synagogue on the Sabbath, where he healed the man with the withered hand. The Pharisees try to bring Jesus down. They're trying to accuse Jesus. They're trying to catch him and trap him and, and trip him up because they're saying, hey, you're breaking Moses' law, or at least their version of Moses' law. And so Jesus heals this man's hand. And as hard-hearted as the Pharisees are, rather than to congratulate this guy who'd been healed, 
Rather than to even thank Jesus or to celebrate the, the grace and the blessing of God, their response was to immediately align themselves with the supporters of Herod, the Herodians, and to begin to plot to kill Jesus. Now, the word withdraw is a strategic word. It's a military term that means that Jesus kind of took a step back. He's not retreating in defeat because he's going to redeploy. He'll redeploy at a later time. With all the conflict that has taken place, the time will come that the conflict will lead to the cross, the final confrontation. But now there's a lot of ministry still to happen. Jesus operates on his time, not on their time. And so there is a lot of time to take place. And so he still has things to accomplish. So he withdrew with his disciples to the sea. Now, Mark tells us there was a great crowd that followed. Not just a crowd. He uses the word great crowd. The emphasis is on the, on the number there. And Mark gives us the location <clears throat> where this crowd is, is coming from. This is not just a local crowd, but these are people that have traveled from all over, some as far as 100 miles away, which it could take you maybe five days to, if you're in good health to be able to travel that distance of foot by foot. Now, we have no way of knowing how long it took those people who were in need of healing, and they were wanting to get there. But Mark tells us the reason that the crowd came from all over. It was because of what Jesus was doing, which is what the crowd is all about. See, they came for the sideshow. They came for the theater. They came for the drama. They came because they wanted their sicknesses healed. They wanted to touch Jesus. And Jesus, telling his disciples, get the boat ready. I mean, that's a kind of a practical idea on his part. I mean, that the, the crowds are pressing him. But here is the, a major point that I want us to see here. And that is, the crowd is about the, so, the show. Jesus is about the message. The good news of God's kingdom is at hand and that God's desires for them are, are more deeply needed than what the crowd is, is pressing Jesus for. Mark clues us in that's what's going on behind the scenes when he tells us about the unclean spirits here that are following Jesus, which I think clearly shows us the contrast between the crowds and what they're about and what Jesus is all about. Son of God is a title, meaning God, the Son, Jesus, the eternal God in the flesh, Jesus, the one and only Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. The Christ, the anointed, set apart. The only one who's able to fulfill and accomplish the will of the Father. Jesus is God choosing to take on our humanity. And in order to be what he was, which was the sinless, the spotless, the perfect Lamb of God, in order to do what he only could do, sacrificing himself in our place, the perfect, in perfect obedience with the Father, He taking the wrath of God and, and the rejection of the Father, all of which should have been ours. I can't, I can't go through that and see that and read that and think about that without it having some, it should impact us, I think. What Jesus did, that He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Jesus also there's a, uses this command here. He strictly ordered them, that is the uh, uh, unclean spirits, he said, not to make him known. To strictly order translates the word that comes from the Old Testament idea of a divine rebuke. Uh, the, the demons identified Jesus as the Son of God. They knew why he was there. They recognized him, and Jesus, with the authority of God, he shuts them down, he shuts them up, and he forbids them to speak. That's contrast. Because, to see, I think the crowd is caught up in all of their, their self-focused paparazziness. I mean, they, they may be clueless, 
uh, and a cluelessness that we kind of see repeatedly over and over again in the Bible. Think ahead, if you would, and think about the crowd there at uh, Palm Sunday. You know how, how crazy they are, and they flip a switch like that within just a matter of days. But the un these unclean spirits, these demons, they understand. They get Jesus. They get why Jesus is there. They recognize that the good the good news of God's kingdom is right there at hand, right there in front of them. But it's too soon for the final conflict and the events to the cross. And so Jesus forbids them because if they, well, he would allow them to go on, it would have created more conflict than he was ready for. So let's think about that crowd. But I want us also to look at another event, and that is the calling that takes place here in verses 13 to 19. Because Mark tells us that they went up, Jesus went up on the mountain. He doesn't tell us which mountain. He says that they went up on a mountain. We don't know, but I think it's any place from the beach of, of Galilee, okay? Anywhere up from there. The mountain, the location is not the point of emphasis that Mark is trying to make for us here. But making the contrast here between the craziness of the crowd and what Jesus does next. Jesus, he separates himself from the crowd and he selects a small group of 12 men to share his life with, his ministry with, in a very special way. And so Jesus called them up to be with him on the mountain. Now Mark gives us these, some details here on what happens here. He He's letting us know three things that take place on the mountain. First, Jesus called those whom he desired. Jesus could have called a thousand people. He could have called 10,000 people, but he called 12. Those whom he desired, or in others, some of your translations will say, those whom he himself wanted. You look at this list uh, of men. And they are a strange, diverse group of 12 ordinary men. There's not a clone in the group. I mean, they provide for themselves. I mean, there's, this is, is a, a handful to herd if you look at them and their backgrounds. None of them are really had any impressive credentials. I mean, thanks to the local synagogue, they were familiar with the, the Hebrew Bible, but, but none of them were scholars. I mean, they were far from being experts in the scriptures. They were most certainly Galileans, most of them probably around the, the northern part there where Capernaum was. Four of them were fishermen. Some of them we practically know nothing about other than their names. We know nothing about it. I mean, it's one thing to choose Simon a.k.a. The Rock, but then the Sons of Thunder? I mean, they probably earned that nickname. Bartholomew, who's elsewhere known as Nathaniel, who Jesus identifies and, and says that he is deeply in, in sync with godliness. But the contrast then with Thomas, who's known as the Doubter, who seemed at times, to most of the time anyhow, to be pretty well clueless. Matthew, who is a hated tax collector, a collaborator with the Roman government. And then you have Simon the Canaanite, or Canaanian, which is Arabic for a zealot. And what tells us here that he is probably a nationalist revolutionary who's uh, sworn, sworn to overthrow the Roman government at all cost. Can you imagine those two together? And hurting that calm, it'd be like herding cats. It just doesn't, not going to work. And Judas Iscariot, who may have been from the southern part of Judea, he was always kind of an outsider, probably from a town in Moab there, which is what Iscariot means, but he never did fit in. Never did seem to fit in. In fact, even Mark just right out there foreshadows the man who betrays Jesus. These 12, Jesus called whom he he desired. We need to let that sink in just a little bit. That, that word desired translates the idea of purpose. Jesus called these guys whom he wanted because he had a divine 
intention for them. He had a purpose for them. Before creation, God, Jesus, in his sovereignty, looked down at the ages of history, through the ages of history, and they hadn't yet unfolded. Jesus, according to his purpose and his will at creation, he desired these 12 men. I mean, God created them. He created the family lines in which they were born. All of the the things that had shaped and developed and, and, and molded their lives to this moment and the, the, all their bizarre diversity, Jesus created and he called them because he desired for them. That was his will. He had a purpose for them. Now, there have been some that we've seen in the crowd uh, as we've studied through Mark who, who followed Jesus, who probably understood very well the message that Jesus was wanting to be taught. Some of them were were people who would seek after God. Some people who we might look at the list and say, you know what, I think they would probably be a better candidate than one of these guys here in the 12. They would fit better into the inner core. But Jesus desired to call these 12. You know, sin having taken its toll in our lives, And as as strange and as odd, mixed up sometimes, and as broken and as weak, and oftentimes clueless as we might be individually, you know, none of us is an accident. We're not a mistake. When When we gather together for worship, and when we come to serve God, that's not random. That's not random. I think that's God has a desire for us to, to, to know him individually and to serve and to worship him collectively. And it's a, it's a purposeful act of God's love and his grace and his mercy towards each of us. <clears throat> so Jesus called on those whom he desired. And I think a second thing we can see here, those Jesus called, they responded. They came to him, the text says. The word here, uh, a word here in the Greek actually has this idea, responded is that they came to him was very intentional. The reason that they went up to the mountain is because Jesus called them to be with him. It's not the mountain that's important. It is Jesus that's important. And, and we've seen in Mark that some of these guys had already responded to Jesus. Some of them already had, had you know, were following him and given things up to follow him. They'd already were were closely associated, already doing that following. And for some on the list, they may have been following in a general sense. And so this is actually a a different response. It's more specific. Meet me at the mountain. And they came. They left behind whatever needed to be left behind. And they came to him because he called them. In John 15, verse 16, Jesus would say on the night that he was betrayed, he'd tell his disciples, he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. God chooses us. And sometimes I think, because we're really big on our free will, and I think that's an important thing. Sometimes, though, we have this strange idea that we choose God. I mean, that, that we can respond to him on our terms. We can respond to him in our way. And we can respond in our timing. And like we, we are a part of the Jesus paparazzi here, and like salvation and redemption and, and serving and following is all about what we say it is, instead of God giving the directions for that. But God in his sovereignty, that's a, that's a good word. He's sovereign. He chooses us, which is a good thing because who else would? Really, who else would? God chooses us, and we need to respond to his terms if we want to become followers of Jesus. See, a lot of times we want to be, we'll be followers, but are we going to be followers of Jesus, or are we going to be followers of some other person or some other individual, or even ourselves? There's a third thing here that I want us to see, and that is those who responded, he appointed in verse 14, 
it, it tells us here, it, it translates a, a Semitic idiom, which is basically, it literally means he made them 12. Robert Coleman, in his book, uh, Master Plan of Evangelism, he, he writes of Jesus, he said, Jesus' concern was not with the programs to reach the multitudes, but with men whom the multitudes would follow. Remarkable as it may seem, Jesus started to gather these men before he ever organized an evangelistic campaign or he ever preached a sermon in public. Men were to be the method, his method, to winning the world to God. The initial objective of Jesus' plan was to enlist men who could bear witness of his life, carry on his work after he had returned to the Father. Men. Men who were willing to leave everything behind and to follow Jesus. Men who were willing to learn. Men who were willing to obey. Men who were willing to, to be pushed out of the, their comfort zones. Men who were willing to be transformed by Jesus. You know, from conformity to the world to being conformed to Jesus. To follow Jesus into the world in the same manner in which Jesus went into the world. Now, Mark has three purposes that he shares with us here uh, of Jesus' appointing or the making of the 12. And the first purpose, well, I guess I jumped ahead on two of them. Sorry, <laughs> you got a preview there. <laughs> the first is that of association. Association, so they might be with him. It's within the nature of Jesus being God and being man, to desire companionship. I, mean, I think back to the very garden with God and Adam and Eve and how that they walked in the cool of the day together. There was companionship. Sin messed up that companionship. But being human means that we are created for companionship. And you can see this in the gospel accounts over and over that Jesus loves to be with his his people. He enjoys the friendships. He enjoys the fellowship. He enjoys sharing the stuff of life with them. And as, you know, for being with him is also for their benefit as well. I mean, it's through this day-to-day -day relationship that the 12 really got to know Jesus. They learned to, to fulfill the task of, of witnessing of him to this world. They're exposed to the powerful influence of his life and his ministry. We would recognize this years later in the book of Acts because as people would be astounded at the teaching and, and they'd be astounded at the, the work of, of, the, of the apostles, especially their wisdom and their knowledge of scripture, knowing that they hadn't studied, what did they recognize? They said that these men had been with Jesus, the living word of God. The second thing here is apostleship, that, that he might send them out to preach. You know, our English word apostle comes from a, a Greek word that means to be sent out or be commissioned. Sent out with a specific message. And in a unique way, the apostle, the word apostle applies to these 12 because each of them is given a unique role in the history uh, of God's kingdom. You know, each one had a, a personal acquaintance with Jesus. They were personally acquainted with his ministry. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus from his baptism by John all the way through to the, his ascension into heaven. In, in the first century, crucifixion was, was a well-known fact. <clears throat> the resurrection was a reality. And it was crucial for the credibility of the message of the apostles that they had personally seen both. So to be an apostle meant having a personal instruction that they got in the gospel message by Jesus. It meant being personally called and commissioned by the risen Lord. And so these men could continue on the ministry of Jesus proclaiming uh, the coming of God's kingdom through his life, his death and the resurrection. And they would go into the whole world as a message and bring his message and his good news. I think it's just, to me, it's, it's just pretty exciting to think about. Then when you, when, you, when you read this, here is the beginning of an evangelistic campaign 
which ultimately leads to ourselves and to the church in the 21st century, it's even here at Westside. We are a part of seeing what Jesus going up on the mountain is all about. And there's a third thing here. Third is authority, having authority to cast out demons, which the 12 did. Casting out demons was a sign that God given authority was, was validating their message to do what Jesus had done in order to demonstrate God's kingdom had arrived. You know, even during Jesus's earthly ministry, very few of his followers are recorded ever having cast out any demons. It's not like Jesus, you know, calls us to go hunt down demons. He doesn't order us to go cast them out. You know, it's, it's not like the issue is exorcism by authority. Jesus' ministry has always been to focus on, the, you know, destroying the work of Satan and the forces of darkness. He didn't come just so he could score a few points with the apostle or uh, with the Pharisees, you know, and, and merely wrestle with flesh and blood. But he came to wrestle with and triumph over the powers of darkness, which is what Jesus did on the cross, isn't it? Which is what happened when he walked out of that tomb very much alive. Paul would later write in Colossians chapter two, verse fifteen. Uh, that Jesus, he said, disarmed the powers and authorities of darkness. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. And in Philippians chapter 2, in verses 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul would also say, God has highly exalted Jesus, or him, Jesus, and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the divine authority that we see with the, the declaration of the demons, uh, you know, being silenced by Jesus. Because Jesus has proven authority over Satan and over their darkness and over death. And so when Jesus sends out the apostles, he sends them out under his authority to proclaim his message without fear, to proclaim his message with boldness, to proclaim his message, even if it means casting out demons as a demonstration of the authority that he has to communicate the message that, that the God's kingdom has come, and he calls us to be followers of Jesus. Jesus called them. He appointed them. He discipled them. He sent them out under his authority, and their ministry of preaching and teaching mirrored his own. The authority that he places them under is the unique moment in his ministry. And what here is, is the first indication that God's plan, God's plan of redemption, Jesus, that which is Jesus' work on the cross, his work on earth, ruling as the King of kings and Lord of lords, is not coming to completion from his earthly ministry. But somehow his disciples fit into it and somehow we fit into it. Well, how do we process all this? Well, there is a question I think we can ask, and that is, are you hanging out on the beaches of Galilee with the crowd? Or have you come to the mountain to be with Jesus? See, what Jesus gets hit by the crowd would have turned any of most any person's heart away from God to themselves. I mean, it would be very, very tempting for most of us to just stay on the beach with a thousand or multiple people yelling at us and coming to us and calling us by name and just being excited. We're there. I mean, Jesus could have had the whole country if that's all he wanted. Yet Jesus isn't distracted by all of the praise of people. He isn't distracted by all of that. There's more to it. We get easily distracted, but Jesus had a purpose entering humanity. The good news and what it takes to get that message out. You know, the crowd is there for the show. For what they can, you know, get, not for what they need. 
And, and Satan has turned their hearts away from God and, and what he has for them. And the crowd following what they want is actually following what Satan wants for them. And it's so easy. It's so easy because it could, it could be that we, we cave to being popular or we cave into peer pressure or we you know, want to avoid conflict. Or we like to just keep the status quo. Or maybe it's because we want big bucks in the bank. Or, or maybe it's we want that promotion at work. Or, or our hearts are so easily turned from God and what God wants for us. It's easy to get sidetracked. Maybe it's, it's driven in us by fear. Or a lost opportunity or some shattered dream. Wounds that are part of the past or, or things that we just can't ever get rid of or let go of. Unresolved issues. Behind that, there's the demons. There's spiritual warfare. Not the Hollywood version. I mean, that's scary enough. But I mean, the real thing, the spiritual battle that goes on behind the scenes, Jesus has authority over all of that. And it's easy for us, when attacked by Satan, to give in to fear and deception. To let our hearts be turned away from God. Because we all have our point of weaknesses. And whatever Satan can use to get his teeth into us and to turn our hearts away, he is going to do that. He's going to use it to distract us from God's calling and God's purpose in our lives to keep us on the beach. We've got to get off the beach. Staying on the beach in Galilee, there is death. On the beach, we're easy targets for Satan and his minions. But then there's another thing for us to consider, another event, the calling, the contrast here. The contrast is really helpful, I think, if, for us to hold on to, because what, what's Jesus all about? Jesus calling these men to himself and making them to be his disciples? and apostles, and then sending them out with authority to proclaim the good news. God chooses us. God chooses us. We don't choose God. I mean, we wouldn't have a clue about God if he hadn't created us with the ability to have a clue about God. And God chooses us, to, he chooses to reveal himself to us and through Christ's work on the cross to save us and to graciously enable us so that we can have an eternal relationship with him. And that's not so much about us choosing God as it is God is the one who's doing the choosing. And we welcome by faith what God has chosen to do. And which is humbling and it's huge to grab onto humbling to be reminded that whatever it is that might turn us away from, from God is worthless compared to the magnitude of what God has done in choosing us. And as messed up and dis distracted and easily turned away as we can be, it's Jesus's desire to call us into a relationship with him. It's going to transform our lives. To call us to himself, to empower us to testify of his good news. I don't think there's anything so deeply satisfying in life than what Jesus, doing what Jesus calls us to do. That's a contrast. That's a choice. The beach is death. And the mountain is life. Whoops. Sorry. I guess I can go back. I want you to see. Yeah, there we go. These days, are you hanging out? Are you hanging out with the crowd? Or have we come up to the mountain to be with Jesus? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. And step one is getting off the beach and choosing to be up on the mountain, which is our invitation this day. M591, have thine own way, Lord. The first step in getting off the beach is allowing God to have his way with us. To have his way with us. To choose to move up to the mountain. 
That's the encouragement to choose to be with him today. Won't you stand as we sing in the song 591, Have Thine Own Way. And if there's a decision that you might have in your life or a need that you have, you just share that with us. Once you step out and you come forward, we'll be glad to pray with you. Answer any question you may have. Appreciate your presence today and hope that it's been a blessing for you to be together as we've been able to sing songs of praise and open God's word. We're going to take a break from Mark for the next few weeks as we prepare and lead up towards Easter, which is only a month away. Okay, so just uh, we're going to be looking at the passion. So just we'll take a break and then we'll get back into it and then we'll take another break and we're going to do that for a little bit. So just so that you, you know about that. The announcements are on the screen, so be sure and take note of those things. Guys, tonight, 5 o'clock, is the final of the uh, Truth Project. So we encourage you to be here for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so very much for your word. Lord God, I thank you for how your word is it's there for us. It's so rich, so full, so filled with just golden nuggets of, of information that we can use to apply to our life if we just spend some time in it. And I thank you, Father, for the time that we've had to just open your word today. And I pray that it'll be an encouragement to each and every one of us, Father, that we would allow you to have your way with us and that you would take us and move us, Father, up to the mountain to be with Jesus. Father, help us as we go from this place this day to the, the work week this follows. That, that Father, Father, that you will just help us to have opportunity to say a good word to somebody about Jesus. Watch over us, we pray, Father. Thank you so much for loving us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Have a great day. Amen.